Hey everyone here, Bethany here with the next chapter and um, I apologize it's going to be a little bit noisy today. I'm visiting my mom and I'm out on her back deck because I wanted to share with you guys this really cool book that I found on her bookshelf. And so even though I'm about an eight hour drive from home, I had to hurry and film this because I can't take the book home with me. So um, it's really cool. Let me grab it here. It is called Quincy Adams Sawyer and uh, the subtitle is A Story of New England Home Life by Charles Fenton Pigeon. And the reason this book is cool, well, a variety of reasons. So first of all, um, my mom was cleaning off her bookshelves and getting rid of a bunch of stuff. And it turns out that when um, my grandma, who is, she's 97, she'll be 98 this summer, and um, she, when she, back when she was cleaning off her bookshelves, my mom absorbed a bunch of my grandma's books. And so um, this book was on my grandma's bookshelf at some point. And what's really interesting is I don't think it was my grandma's either. Based on the copyright date, I actually think this book might have belonged to my great grandpa or maybe even my great great grandparents. Um, hard to say, but what's cool about it is I did a little research on it and this book was originally published in 1900 and it has sold a quarter of a million copies, which is pretty cool for that time period. And it was actually republished, uh, another print run in 1902. And that's when this copy came from, is 1902. I couldn't actually find a copyright date in it. Um, but in the front, let's see if I can find it here, an author's preface in the front. And you can see at the bottom there that the preface date on it is 1902. Now, my mom is just going to throw this book in the garbage because as you can see, it's really tattered. It looks like it has a lot of damage. And in fact, um, the pages are outright <laughs> falling out of the cover. And this is what's really cool. You can see it's actually a, a sewn binding. So that's really neat. Um, but I didn't even really give this much book much thought, except it got set down in a pile, and um, I picked it up, and as I was flipping through it, I, it looked boring to me. But then when I flipped into the back of it, it had advertisements for other books, and that's where it caught my eye, because the books that it was advertising made me think that maybe this book isn't so boring after all, because of the types of books that are being advertised in the back. I mean, generally you advertise books that are, um, th they will, the reader will want to read those books as well, if whoever reads this book. And so as you can see in the back, we have this here, this advertisement, Love Stories from Real Life by Mildred Champagne. Then we have um, Hester Blair, A Romance of a Country Girl. Miss Petticoats. And what is fun about those is the other thing that I looked up when I was looking up these books, I thought um, those books in the back were on, on sale for a dollar and fifty cents is what the advertised price to purchase of those books was. And so I assume because you tend to advertise in like things that this book was also probably about that price point. Um, so I did a little bit of Googling, like did a inflation calculator. And what I discovered, number one, inflation calculators only go back to 1913. And this book is from 1902. And so the best I was able to go back was to convert the $1.50 in 1913, what it converted to 2021 prices. And so if you bought this book in 1913 for $1.50, you would buy it today for... Um, almost $40. So that is no small amount of change back then. So um, the other thing that I kind of was researching about is I was curious about how my, when my grandparents might have gotten this book, I, I dug into a little more and it belonged to one of two people, either my great great grandfather or my great great grandmother. And my great great grandfather was actually born in 1893 in Olney, England. And his family immigrated to the United States in 1902, which is when this book was published. And so I'm thinking that they probably didn't purchase this book. Um, 
at least not at that time, because they certainly wouldn't have had the money to do so. And I'm wondering if based on the ads in the back that the content of this book might have appealed more to a woman like maybe maybe my great great grandmother. I don't know. She was born in America in 1895. So she would have only been what five seven years old when this book was published this particular copy. So it's possible that maybe since it was so popular at the time that maybe they acquired it through other means. Maybe they picked it up at a thrift store later or got a copy from a friend, that kind of thing. They maybe didn't buy it when it was newly released. And we also know it was very popular because my Googling tells me that this book was actually made into not one, but two silent films. So one in 1912 and another in 1922, which I thought was really cool. So I'm very intrigued by this. I don't think I'm going to read this copy, but I um, found online where there's places you can go where you can read scanned in novels of old um, books that are out of copyright. And I found it on there. So, and I actually found the books that are advertised in the back too. So I might go back and try to find those and, and read it and just to see because I'm curious why was this book so popular so anyway I thought that was cool and I wanted to share that with you guys a um, couple other things I've been doing on this trip uh, we, we've been out here helping my mom so last fall we came to visit her and we built her some really cool garden beds that are a little bit uh, taller so they're easier for her to get in there and garden without having to bend over and you know dig around in the dirt on her knees or anything so she can garden from standing up and so we built those last fall and then since we're here in the spring now she had a big load of dirt delivered and so we spent a lot of this week digging dirt and filling those garden beds so that was a big job um, we also went one day down to the uh, there's like an Air, aerospace museum and my husband really likes that kind of thing so we went down there and checked out the aerospace museum with all the kids and then the other fun thing just fun to show you um, we've been playing this really fun game with my mom we introduced her to and she's been having a blast it's called the crew and the crew is a um, card game it's a trick-taking style game so if you've ever played games like um, what, hearts or spades or Oh hell, those types of games, and you know how to play tr trick-taking games, then this is a super fun game. It sounds really strange, but it's a cooperative game. And so it's sort of a cross between like the trick-taking aspect of hearts, but then it has different goals that you have to accomplish each round. So different goals like you know how in phase 10, if you've ever played that, you have a different goal every time you want to play. Um, then so this has different goals every time but you have to work together so in um in that regard so it might tell you on one one game you your goal might be to give a certain player the green three and so it, it requires a little bit of working together to make sure that that player gets the green three and so you're aiming to beat the game and not beat each other on this game so that's pretty fun. Um, give it a try. It's only like 15 bucks. So if you have any older people in your life, or you are an older people, I don't know, who loves playing cards, and particularly I've noticed that um, my generation and older into my mom and my grandparents' generation, they're big into those trick-taking card games. And so this is one that I think that can really cross that divide and you can really enjoy playing it with multiple generations. Um, we've had a, a blast with this one, so go check it out. Um, yeah, so uh, I hope you enjoyed that, and I will talk to you guys later. Bye!